this lecture really combines two separate chapters, one on mental health and one on social relationships and aging. So we'll start with mental health. Uh, mental health in an adulthood uh, is uh, often the result of a gene by environment interaction where disorders develop from a genetic propensity in combination with cultural or environmental influences. Um, one of the reasons that we see developmental differences in mental health is that people might get environmental influences at different times in adulthood. <clears throat> when we lift, look at this figure, what we can see is that uh, middle adults are kind of the most vulnerable to life stress compared to older adults. Uh, and this graph is showing one month prevalence rate. So the per percentage of people experiencing a serious psychological distress in one month period. And so again, you can see the highest prevalence in middle adulthood and the lowest for older adulthood. Um, one of the reasons could have to do with the emotional resources that people have uh, where um, as people get older, they get better at self-regulating, which help, helps them cope with some kind of stressor. Depression is fairly common in older adulthood, but it's not necessarily a normal part of growing older. So about 20% of older adults in a community samples and 50% in nursing homes suffer from depressive symptoms. And women are more likely than men, although the gender gap tends to lessen in older adulthood. Uh, depression is really important to study because it leads to physical, mental, and social impairment, so it can have a big uh, array of effects. <clears throat> Major depression or major depressive disorder is intense depression for a relatively short period of time, or dysthymia, which is now called persistent depressive disorder, is kind of chronic low-grade depression. And when we compare older adults with depression compared to younger adults with depression, we see some differences. Uh, older adults are less likely to have the affective symptoms like feelings of sadness and guilt, where they're more likely to have cognitive symptoms, so memory problems or executive functioning deficits. They also have more somatic issues like fatigue and sleep disturbance, and also more loss of interest in activities. And what we see in older adulthood is the setting makes a big impact in terms of predicting depression. Uh, the light bars in this are major depressive disorder. The dark bars are significant depressive symptoms, although not necessarily a diagnosis. What we can see is uh, there's relatively low prevalence of depression in those in the community, but especially if you look at these symptoms, um, we see higher depressive symptoms for people who are older adults who have been institutionalized. A really negative outcome of depression is on occasion suicide. Uh, so this is suicide rates by age from 2000 to 2013. And what you can see pretty consistently is those over 85 uh, have the highest suicide rates, although we do see these middle adults kind of creeping up in the relatively recent past. Older adults complete 20% of all suicides, but only make up 30% of or 13% of the population. So they have the highest suicide completion rate. And so this is definitely something that we need to consider. And there's a multitude of risk factors associated with suicide in older adulthood. Uh, some of these are shared with younger adults, but some are more common in older adults. So being male, uh, depression, uh, previous suicide attempt are all kind of common throughout adulthood. Um, but things like widowhood, physical illness, social isolation, and family discord are much more common in older adulthood and can be predictors of suicide. Another common type of disorder in older adulthood is anxiety disorders. Uh, so phobias, generalized anxiety disorder, and panic disorders all kind of fall into this category. Uh, and specific phobias and social phobias are the most common. Uh, the rates of anxiety disorders in older adulthood are lower than at other points of adulthood, but you still have a, a very high number, again, of these subclinical anxiety symptoms. We generally see that anxiety disorders are stable throughout adulthood. So if individuals have anxiety in middle adulthood, they're more likely to have it in older adulthood as well. Um, but it's often really hard to diagnose uh, anxiety in older adulthood, um, partially because it might overlap with depressive symptoms if it's more of the affective symptoms. Um, one of the big cognitive symptoms of anxiety disorders is, is worry. Um, 
and often worry from anxiety can kind of overlap with medical service use. Um, so adults who have more worry tend to focus on the content of the worry. So doctors will say, oh, you're worrying, your, your heart is racing, you have shortness of breath. Um, and so they look at targeting those physiological symptoms as opposed to kind of the pattern, the thought pattern that leads to that anxiety, which might be what's actually causing the problem. Um, so sometimes it's the anxiety that causes the health problems rather than health problems causing the anxiety, and this often gets missed in the medical field. Another common category of disorders in older adulthood is sleep disorders. Um, so about 50% of adult, older adults complain of sleep problems at any moment in time. And sleep problems are really important to understand because they can cause greater risk for physical or mental health problems, uh, also more functional disability and de decreased quality of life and increased mortality. Um, so sleep disorders may cause disruptive sleep patterns uh, and might have various causes. Uh, insomnia is very common uh, in community samples of older adults, about 15 to 45% have problems initiating sleep. 20 to 65 percent have disrupted sleep and 15 to 54 percent have terminal insomnia so very common up to half or more experiencing insomnia um, disruptive sleep disorders are things like problematic breathing limb movements or REM behavior disorder uh, what we find is that older adults who have sleep disorders have increased diagnosis of, of chronic illnesses, they're taking more medications, they have more psychiatric disorders. Um, and one of the big reasons for this is that age tends to reduce the synchronization of circadian rhythms. Um, so older adults tend to start going to sleep earlier, they start waking up earlier, and this can cause more disordered sleep. And now we are going to shift to social relationships. Uh, so there's a couple of big shifts in terms of marriage and parenthood in older adulthood. Um, we see an increasing involvement between adult children and their parents. So about 42% of adult children talk to a parent every day. And we do see kind of increasing support from families. Um, so they're having more frequent contact, even if it's just by phone. Uh, more are rating families as the greatest sort of source of satisfaction in their lives. Uh, and when people have a personal problem, family are usually the first place to turn. So kind of identifying families as an important role is, is really necessary. Uh, another um, place that can cause stress is widowhood. So um, in terms of the loss of a spouse, women tend to cope better with the loss of a spouse than men. But older people who lose a spouse do better than younger younger adults. So it makes sense this is more normative and expected to lose a spouse in older adulthood and so those who use, lose a spouse young have a particularly difficult time. In terms of grandparenting, uh, the average age for becoming a first-time grandparent is in the mid-50s and grandparenthood is associated with feelings of kind of extension of themselves and the family, emotional fulfillment and companionship. Uh, and grandparents take kind of distant roles. Some are more formal, some want to be kind of the fun-seeking grandparent, and some kind of take on this role as a distant figure and are less involved. But one common thing we see as we're adding more generations is what's called beanpole families. So beanpole families are when you have four or five generations alive simultaneously, but only a few members of each generation. So this graph shows kind of the increasing percentages of households who only have one person or one person per generation in it. Um, so this is kind of that beanpole family of more generations but fewer people in each one. This means that older adults spend less time participating in various family roles than they used to uh, because there's fewer people to fill each role. Uh, and this really results in smaller households and kind of more dispersed family networks. Another kind of important component of social relationships is common in older adults, it is loneliness. Uh, and there's really two components. Um, emotional isolation has to do with the absence of emotional attachments. Um, so someone who, for example, has lost a spouse might feel lonely even in the company of family and friends. Uh, and social isolation is really the loss or absence of social ties where there really is no one that the individual can turn to. Um, 
Um, we know that the lack of social ties um, is strongly linked to poor health, although it doesn't always necessarily mean, mean loneliness. Um, but those who are feeling lonely as a result of, of social ties have the most negative outcomes. And social isolation and loneliness early on uh, can actually predict cardiovascular risk later on. So although loneliness is more common in older adulthood, uh, it happens earlier and that loneliness early on can have an impact on health later. Loneliness is really important because it influences the rate at which physiological reserves decrease with age. Um, so loneliness is associated with poor health behavior. So higher calorie diets, high fats, um, smoking, higher BMI, uh, all of these are more common in lonely people as opposed to non-lonely people. Um, we also see people who are more lonely get exposed to more stressful life events and have more chronic life stress. And when lonely people are exposed to stressful life events, they have poor coping strategies. So they do less active coping, they do less trying to do something about the problem, uh, and more withdrawal. So when you don't have the social supports, when you do experience problems, it causes kind of greater impacts, especially in terms of health. Uh, and so it's possible that kind of uh, the lack of social support leads to uh, the high intensity of stress response. So lonely adults have higher blood pressure and more stress hormones when they're exposed to stress. Now, it's kind of the flip side of that is it is possible to kind of have a restorative process so things like sleep can replenish lonely and non-lonely people's physiological reserves and kind of protect from future stress. So it's not necessarily something that can't be addressed, but uh, it can cause more stressors. Okay, finally, uh, something that many people don't necessarily think of, but is still a big part of older adulthood social socialization is sexuality. Um, so middle adults engage in sexual activity less frequently than younger adults, uh, and you tend to see kind of a gradual re reduction in sexual responsiveness, but older adults still have a desire for in intimacy and sexuality. Um, in people ages 60 to 71, 50% report having intercourse on a regular basis. So in general, older adults are still sexual, sexually active, um, although there are also kind of more sexual problems. So things like low desire and erectile difficulties are more common in later adulthood. Um, and this is kind of an interesting to phenomenon to, to think about because many assisted living facilities kind of police older adults in terms of their sexual uh, escapades and sexual freedom. Um, but actually, there's evidence that kind of having an active sex life is, is important for uh, healthy older adulthood and older adult socialization. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. And that is it.